All right. Hey, good morning. Three Circle Church, man. Good to be with you guys and all of our campuses joining us on uh, line right now from uh, Thomasville. And we have Midtown Mobile. Incredible what God's doing at both of those campuses. We have Daphne and online, man. Great to be with you guys. So we're going to continue the neighbor series today. And my hope is, my hope is that you are learning and being inspired and ultimately wanting to become more and more like Jesus. That's, that, that's the real hope. So what we're doing each week is we dive back into this most beloved of Jesus' parables, uh, the Good Samaritan, and we're learning more and more from it. So today we're going to do the same. Now, when you think about Mr. Rogers, what an icon, right? Iconic and so nerdy at the same time, and it shows you that, you, that like cool is, that's why we say kindness is cool. The red cardigan, the shoes, throwing it from one hand to another, having all of his buddies, the puppets that were always weird and you knew it was his voice, and still you loved them. And it's because it was all about kindness. It was a language that he used. And Mr. Rogers was not trying to pick his neighbors. Instead, he was trying to be a neighbor. He was inviting all of you to be his neighbor because he was going to be a neighbor. And that's kind of the point of the Good Samaritan story. The point of the Good Samaritan parable is not how to identify our neighbors, but instead how to be a neighbor. It's not choosing your neighbors. It's choosing to be one. And that's what this series is all about. So as we've done each week, we're going to read the parable. And then we'll dive right in. So let's go to the word of God, Luke 10, 25. It says this, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But... He, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan... As he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. In other words, Jesus is saying what you've seen in this parable is now a command. You go live like this. You go do life like this. Now, let's dive in today because each week we look at it from a different angle. And something I want to show you today is where true neighboring begins. Because I think many of us think that, that neighboring begins out there. Like you're thinking, okay, the the people that are far from me, and that is certainly a part of the story. But I want you to see where neighboring begins. Not where it ends, but where it begins today. John Bloom wrote an article. He's a theologian connected with Desiring God. And he wrote an article years ago for Desiring God that impacted me greatly on this subject. And it has inspired this sermon that you're going to hear today. And I want to use one of his quotes. John Bloom, Desiring God, said this, The neighbor we are called to love is often not one we choose, but one God chooses for us. Now that's tough. This is tough because we don't like anyone choosing for us. We like our choices. What this means is theologically, we believe in God's sovereignty. God is sovereign over the people that end up in our lives. If I believe God is sovereign over all things, that includes the people in my life. That includes the parents that happen to be on the ball team that my kid's on. That includes the waitress that happens to wait on my table. That includes these people that are in my life. I need to have a presupposition that that is, that is God's sovereignty in my life. These people are here for a reason. The problem is we're addicted to the ability to choose, aren't we? Human beings are addicted to our ability to choose. We want our choices. Now, We live in a time now where you have 300 channels on your TV, right? But there was a time where we didn't have that many. And I want to know where my people are. How many of you remember when you had one of these on your house? Remember that? How many of you remember being a kid and watching a ball game and it gets a little fuzzy and your dad says, hey, go outside and turn the antenna, shake it a little bit. 
So you go outside and you start twisting the antenna. That's it, son, you got it. Whoop, nope, pull it back a little bit. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Where are my people? All, all the millennials in the room are like, an antenna? What? Antenna? What's an antenna? Well, it's this thing that helped us watch stuff. But we didn't have a lot of choices. You had to go and get that one zoomed in. And, and even then, you still only had just a few choices. But now we have a plethora of choices. We have 350 channels. We have Spotify. I grew up where, with cassette tapes where you'd have to just guess if that was where your song was. Just wear that thing out, man. Right? And now, now I got Spotify. I can listen to any music anywhere in the world at any time for $9.99 a month. It's amazing. You have choices with food now. 25 years ago when I was in college and coming over to Baldwin County, 20 years ago, whenever that was, there was like a few restaurants. Now we have every cuisine you can imagine right here. And even in Thomasville, one of our campuses, our very small town, they got one of the best steakhouses in Alabama, literally in Thomasville, Alabama. It's amazing. So... We have choices. So when, when we come across something where we go, we don't get to choose, we don't like that. We're like, whoa, whoa, you can't take my choice away. I want to choose. But God is sovereign. He makes choices for us when it comes to neighboring. Listen, we are addicted to that ability to choose. I want you to write it down. It's an addiction that we got to break when it comes to neighboring. And that was the point. The scribe wanted to choose his neighbor's. And Jesus is saying, you don't need to worry about choosing your neighbors. You need to worry about being a neighbor. In other words, Jesus is like, I'll bring you the neighbors. And that's what happened in the Samaritan story. One thing you may have not noticed, the Samaritan did not choose the Jew, and the Jew didn't choose the Samaritan because they would have never chosen each other. So I promise you, when the Samaritan walked down the road and saw who it was that was beat up, he was like, great, a Jew. But he's a good guy, so he's going to do the right thing. But he, he wasn't like, that's who. Because he knew that guy had trashed his people his whole life. He knew a Jew hated him. He knew what a Jew called him, right? And I promise you, when the Jew finally woke up and looked and, oh, someone's rescuing me. Oh, great. Samaritan. It'd be like a bammer waking up in an Aubies taking care of him. You know what I mean? Let's just have a little fun. And th this is what it looked like for the Samaritan. I promise you, you wouldn't have chosen. This is not the choices that would have been made. And you're going to find that in, in, in what I'm going to teach you today about neighboring, sometimes you don't choose. It wouldn't be who you'd choose. And I'm going to show you some places that might surprise you where you didn't choose. And that God wants you to be a neighbor. They would have never chosen one Another. Listen to G.K. Chesterton, a great theologian. Listen to his powerful words on this subject. He says this, we make our friends and, so make means choose. We make our friends and we make our enemies. Watch this, but God makes our neighbors. He makes your neighbor. The old scriptural language showed so sharp of wisdom when it spoke, not of one's duty towards humanity like a mass of people, but instead one's duty towards your neighbor. The duty towards humanity may often take the form of some choice, which is personal or even pleasurable. But we, we have to love, watch this, we have to love our neighbor because he is there. A much more alarming reason for a much more serious operation. Watch this, he is the sample of humanity which has actually been given to us. GK dropping the flames. That's good stuff, isn't it? And I read that and I go, man, I wish I could write like that. But uh, alas, I'll just quote GK. So let's talk about neighbors that you didn't choose, and this may surprise you. Because there's some, there's some neighbors that God wants you to love. And God wants you to use the biblical neighboring rules in your interactions with them that maybe you didn't realize. And the first neighbors in your life that you didn't choose is your family. Oh, man, I could just feel that all the way across the room. I could feel it in Thomasville, and you guys are two hours away. Okay, so let's talk about this. Your family. Yeah, you didn't choose the family God gave you. And see, one thing that accompanies uh, our ability to have so many choices is also a fatigue of choice. Like, it's like, we're all, oh my gosh, what do we do? And then when we do finally choose, often then we begin to go, did we choose right? Did we make the right choice? And, and we'll do, like, you'll go out to eat, and you'll go, you know, but we could have went there. 
and you're watching one Netflix uh, series and you're like, but our friends, are, which one do we choose? We only have so much time, right? So many choices. But you don't have to worry about this one because you didn't choose them. And it's your family. It's your mom and dad or stepmom and dad. Now let me talk about this. Because many of you in this room had good families, but some of you had bad ones. Some of you had traumatic ones and abusive ones. Some of you had really bad situations and good ones. And God knows all of that. And still, God allowed you to be in that family. Okay? For some reason, even if it was a bad one, what you can do is go, I don't understand why, but I know still I didn't choose that. So what must I do with that as Christians? What should we do with that? And so... The Bible tells us in Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. That idea of honoring, and and really the idea would be your families, that idea of honor is a lifelong command. It didn't end when you walked out the door. It's a lifelong command. So today what I would say to us, we as Christians, if we want to be what God's called us to be, we, by his power, have to figure it out. And what you're going to find is all of these areas I'm going to talk to you about are God-given laboratories where we learn to be neighbors. It's the lab, all right? And you're going to learn that it has to happen in here before it can happen out there. And GK's point that we just read is he's like, look, when you get on a plane and go to another country, that's good that you're doing that. Wherever it is, it's good to be a neighbor to them. But what good is it if you can do that but can't be a neighbor to people that are close to you? GK's point is, the hard one to do is the one who's close to you. The hardest one to be the neighbor to is the one that's been given to you. All right? And so as we look into this, what does that mean to honor? Now let me tell you something that I've observed. And I am, I've been, man, I've been so convicted by this stuff. Sometimes the sermon really preaches me before it preaches to you, okay? So, I think adults, once we become adults, we can be almost unendingly merciful towards our friend groups. We can overlook a plethora of faults. If they say something that's crazy and dumb, we just laugh it off. (laughs) It's just them. They're good people. We love our friends. But you let our mom or our dad just say something a little bit off and we will shred them. Right? Even if it's not external, it's internal. And we find way. We're really hard, our brothers are saying, we're really hard on our families. And really like, oh, but they're great. They're my buddies. They're my friends. And the Bible says, no, you've got you've to honor these people. You've got to figure out what that looks like. Now, what does honoring mean? Okay, well, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. This may be helpful because some of you are like, you don't know my family, bro. So let me help you here. Honoring does not mean agreeing. That will help you. Because if honoring means agreeing all the time, then I can't pull it off. I don't always agree. And you don't either. Even with good families and good parents, sometimes you're like, I just can't. Sorry. Well, the Bible's not asking you to agree. The Bible's asking you to honor. Honor doesn't mean agreeing with everything. Honor doesn't mean saying everything they did was great. This is why even a person coming out of an abusive situation can find a way to honor. And I'm going to teach you what that means. Watch this. Because honoring, if if you came out of a really bad family and you go, Chris, I can't engage and interact with my family in any way. It will become detrimental to me and my family. It's a bad situation. Then I go, I get that, absolutely. Then what honoring means for you may mean praying for them. That's a form of engagement that they matter enough for you to pray for them. And that may be all you can do, but you have to decide. But let me just help you. If you're in this room and your family just gets on your nerves, you can do more than pray for them. Okay? So that's not letting you off the hook. But if you really, and God knows, and you know that situation, then at the very least you can engage because honoring means a a level of engagement. Honoring means I'm going to stay in this. I'm engaging at some level. So what does honoring look like? For kids, if you're a child or a teenager, if you're still in the house, you're still under that authority, listen, honor means obedience. That's what it means for a kid. You honor by obeying when you're a kid. That's why in my house, I have to remind my kids, hey, I, you got to obey. And I have like a teenager now who's driving. I have to remind him sometimes, hey, still got to obey. You know that phone? I pay for it. You know that car? See? 
Like when, a, when, when you have a teenager that feels like they're 35, you have to remind them, 35-year-olds pay their bills. <laughs> you don't. You know that cold air that was blowing on you last night while you were sleeping? <laughs> Paid for it. <laughs> Shoes you're wearing, they're nice. <laughs> yep, that's right, Daddy. That waffle you're eating right now while you're talking to me? Daddy paid for it. Come on, I'll get an amen in this room. <laughs> Children have to obey. That's what honoring looks like. Well, what does it look like for adults? Adults honor through not obedience. You don't, it changes. Watch this. The application changes. The command remains. Honor your parents. What does it look like? Well, you keep figuring that out. What it becomes as adults is our respect and our deference. That's what it begins to look like. It begins to look, and you figure that, and it may be for you that your situation's so bad, all you can do is pray. Praise God that you stay in it, though. You engage, and you pray, and you stay hopeful. But for some of you, it's just going to mean, look, I'm going to be honest with you. For some of you, it means stop being mean to your parents and picking them apart and being so nice to your friends all the time. Some of you, it means that. Some of you, it means stop being a jerk to your family. Because you go, well, my family's hard to deal with, and this is what God's reminded me of through this series. Chris, you're hard to deal with, too. Let me tell you, because of this teaching that I've been preparing for y'all, I had a recently a lunch with a family member of mine that sometimes I have a hard time with. We went to lunch. And we had one of the best two hours of just fun, fellowship, love. It was awesome. I got in the car, and as I was leaving, I thought, what was different? And it was like the Holy Spirit spoke to me internally, said, you were different. They didn't, there was nothing different. You were different. You stopped putting everything on the other person, and you got your heart right. And you looked at it differently. Does that make sense, church? It changed so much. Changed everything. So as adults, it changed. So kids obey. Adults do it through respect and deference. Listen, all of the biblical rules of loving our neighbor begins first with our families. Your families are your neighbor. Your brothers, your sisters, your crazy cousin, your uncle. You know? That's where it starts. And again, our families and all these other things I'm going to show you today, our families are God-designed laboratories for neighboring. It's where we learn. Before we go out there, we do it in the lab. And God teaches us in these laboratories. When I was a kid playing sports, our coaches would tell us, look, if you can't tackle your buddy here in practice, you're not going to be able to tackle him out there. If you can't hit your buddy pitching to you here, if you can't hit his pitches, what are you going to do with a guy that you don't know? How are you going to handle? So we would play each other to practice so that we were ready when we played the other team. Church, if we can't get it right in our families, and you're going to see even with one another in church, if we can't neighbor the first line of neighbors that God's given us, we're not going to do it very well out there. It's here. It's us. It's in our family. So it starts there. It starts there. Not only that, children. Let's talk about that. If you have kids, if you're a guardian, if you're a foster parent, if you're an adoptive parent, if you're a biological parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're a guardian of kids, your kids are now your neighbors. Oh, Lord. Hard, isn't it? It's hard. Your kids are a gift to you. Listen to Psalm 127.3. Behold, children are a heritage. And that word in the original language means a gift. A gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. That, and, and so this tells you that even the unborn child is a gift from God. So like an, another one of those great verses for, for our stance on life. But the point here is children are a gift. And they're not just a gift to you when they're easy. No, a laboratory is not, that's a laboratory is to throw stuff together. And that's what God has done. When he stuck you in a family, you didn't choose your family growing up. And some of you may go, and I wouldn't have chosen them. Yes, that's right. God put you there for a reason. And he had a reason. And I don't know why, but you can trust him in that. But, but now that you have kids, you go, well, I did choose to have kids, so that doesn't work. You go, well, yeah, you may have, but you didn't choose everything that came along with them, did you? You didn't choose your kids' personalities. You didn't choose the friends your kids would choose. You didn't choose what they'd be good at and what they're not. You chose the, the opportunity possibly to be a parent, but you didn't choose what came along with it. Hey, 
When I had my first kid, I did the Lion King thing. Hey, I'm there, holding this little baby. And then I got home, and as years go by, I go, man, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> Let me tell you, why my kids are such a gift to me, and I'll tell you one reason why. Can I just shoot you straight? Y'all cool with that? I like Sundays, and, and, and for many reasons. But one thing is, y'all all listen to me. <laughs> yeah. You think, for the most part, that I might know what I'm talking about. And then I go home. <laughs> and they are a gift because this afternoon I will go home. And my kids are not impressed with my communication ability. They don't care that I've written a book. They don't care what's on the websites, what other places think about me. They just want me to cook them some, I don't know, quesadillas. Because I make good quesadillas. So I'll come home and I'll, hey, what are we eating? No, Dad, great job today. No, Dad, I bet you changed a lot of lives today. Thank you. <laughs> I've never once, come home, thank you for your commitment to the word. <laughs> I get, where are we eating, Dad? <laughs> Give me $10, Dad. I'm dying an economic death right now of $10 at a time. <laughs> Give me 10, Dad. Give me 10. It's just 10. I'm like, 10, 400 times is a lot, son. But they're a gift for me. Listen, Paul David Tripp in a great book called Gospel Parenting that I think maybe in a resource it has been, it, 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 he says this, when you are raising your 